almost a minute of time, so I'm not sure an introduction is really in order here. Uh, but let me say that I thought when I read this book, it was reminiscent of the color pur purple and the, the devastation of the domestic violence and also the beauty of the, the character who was able to um, move past and save herself in the situation. So we're thrilled to have her be part of our family and also to have her book passage. Well, thank you. Well, I know everybody here. <laughs> I, I now know you guys too. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm just, I'm so glad everybody came. Thank you. I feel silly sitting behind this desk. I feel like I should be sitting out there with you. But thank you so much for coming out. That means everything to me. And the publication of this novel has been like the best thing that's ever happened to me. It's been absolutely amazing. It's changed my life. And Andy and Leslie, <laughs> thank you so much for everything that you've done for me. This is just beautiful. Um, I was, I have, I have a speech that I give at my readings, but I'm not giving it tonight because, <laughs> first of all, I know everyone here. And second of all, it felt like I was thinking about on the plane today when I was flying out, and um, I was kind of going over it in my head, and I was like, this just doesn't feel right to me today. Like it's not really where I am. The speech I've been giving is about. Like my kneecap almost fell off the day before my book came out and I thought I was going to be in a wheelchair and it's about the beauty of broken things. And, and I love it, but I was like, that's not, that's not where I am. And I asked myself where I really am today and um, the place that I am, I feel, is really about transitions. Like, I feel like I'm in a place, an in-between place. You know, I've, I've gone from being something that I was before the book came out and to being a writer, and it's been an interesting and jarring and beautiful experience. And today I was talking to Andy, and um, he was telling me that a National Book Award author used him as a character in her book. And um, I said, well, you never want me to use you as a character in my books. And he's like, no, I would never want to be daddy or mom. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be Iggy. <laughs> I really wouldn't want to be Iggy. What I didn't tell my sweet Andy. <laughs> <laughs> mama is me. <laughs> I, I actually based Mama on myself. She is sort of a version of what I really, when I started to write this novel, believed I could have become if I hadn't made the choices that I made. Um, when I was in my 20s, I was in a really terrible relationship, an abusive relationship, and um, I was headed down that road. And I made the really radical and impulsive decision to walk out the door with my two children and nothing else. I mean, I had nowhere to go, I had nothing to do um, except for run. And somehow everything came together and coalesced and my life became this thing of beauty. But you don't know that's going to happen when you're walking out that door. So that moment at the end of the book where Mara makes that decision to walk down the railroad tracks. No spoiler me. alert. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> we may or may not have all read it. Mara may or may not have all read it. Well, it's too late. We don't know what she's doing in the railroad tracks. Right. Well, she just makes a decision to walk on the railroad tracks. Right. <laughs> she she likes, likes trains. Right. She does. <laughs> Every, I've been getting um, mostly really, really positive reviews. But the few negative things that people have said are about the ending, and they're like, it's such a dark ending, it's such a hopeless ending. And for me, it doesn't feel like a hopeless ending. For me, it feels like the most hopeful ending in the world, because I know what lays at the end of the railroad mm -hmm. tracks. I know what happens when you find that courage to stand up and walk out the door and become what you're born to be. And these three humans here, I know because um, of what I did after I walked out the door, which is um, I married a pilot and I started following rock bands. <laughs> so I, um, I followed this one band, Roger Klein and the Peacemakers, enough. I am not taking this unseriously. I followed them enough that I would have gone around the globe over five times <laughs> with all the miles that I walked you following this fans. Fans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, um, I figured out who I was and I, I was chasing the horizon to be really cliche, but there was something about just all of a sudden leaving. Barnaby is really based on the town that I was in when I was in this abusive relationship and um, just leaving that cloistered thing to run out and be an absolutely free being and to find out who I was and then to end up in a safe place every night because this band that I really, really loved and these people that became family to me were there. So it was like I could, 
I could move all over the world and my family was still there at the end. So that became a huge part of my identity. And I had this pair of, you guys know, my I, I went groupy really, really far and I bought all these like slutty clothes and I had like these big thigh high boots that but they're like this the heels are like this big, not exactly. And they're thigh high and I wore them to all my shows. And so last night, um, when I was coming out, Andy's having a big party for me tomorrow to introduce me to some of the people that he thinks can help me with the marketing of my book and um, I was I was gonna buy a new dress and I was like, you know what, I'm a starving artist. I have like 50 dresses, I'll, I'll, I'll find one. So I go home and I start going through my closet and every one of my dresses makes me look like a whore. <laughs> They're all up to here and down to here and I'm like, okay, all right, well, I guess I'm, I'm gonna have to transition from groupie phase into grown up writer phase. And so I went to my daughter's room because she steals all my clothes and um, I was rifling through her clothes trying to find something I could wear. And I found one of my thigh high groupie boots. <laughs> and it was tattered, like the leather was falling off. It was really ugly. And I almost started crying because I was like, wow, like this is over. Like I'm not this anymore. I'm something different. And um, it was because that was such a beautiful piece of me, it was really painful to think, even though what's happening now is beautiful, that I was losing it. And so I went back in my room and I was packing my bag and I had these boots packed for the trip. I'll show them to you. And then I looked down and I went, well, look. Like, I am so totally still in touch with my hair more. And, and so I, I thought about that and I thought about the fact that no matter what is happening to us or how we're changing, there is something about us that remains the same and something about us that remains constant. And um, when I named Mara Stonebrook, I named her on purpose. It wasn't just a name I pulled out of the hat. I named her Mara because in the Bible, Mara means bitter and her life is so bitter. And I named her Stonebrook because she's underneath all of the water that flows over her and all of the things that happen to her and all of the ways that she changes, the way that the river that she's always looking at changes. She's a stone. There's something inside of her that's solid that never changes. And I think that what I'm coming, coming to find out about myself as I'm going through this process of changing is that um, I have that in me. So it's been a really, really beautiful process. And I've gotten letters from people, a lot of beautiful letters. I'm sorry, it makes me choke up to think about them. But um, that tell me um, this book has changed their lives. And one of the books that I got was from a girl who told me that she had been raped. And she said that she felt like she was damaged goods. And I wrote her back, and I said exactly what I just said to you. And I said, you know, there's that river in the book. And you look at it, and it changes form, and it changes shape, and it gets rained on, it gets frozen. But it's always a river and it's not damaged goods. Whatever form it's in, whatever has happened to it, it's always the most beautiful river that it can be. And um, that's what I hope that people take away from this book. Today, I, I get a lot of beautiful letters, but I also got one from someone today that said he sees a lot of broken, but not much beauty. And I really, really hope that people can read between the lines and see there's something in here that is more than just pain because I had to write the pain to get to the strength, and I had to write the ugly to get to the beauty. And that's what I hope is in this book. So I'm going to read the first chapter, and I'm all emotional now. <laughs> so I'm going to try not to cry. First chapter of Beauty of the Broken. Mama and Willie McIntyre made Iggy in the barn. It was an act of passion, I heard my mom say to her cousin. She was on the phone at the kitchen table while Daddy was off on some hunting trip. Why she was bearing her heart to this relative she sees maybe once every five years, I don't know. She says she's like a sister to her, but I don't understand how because they almost never talk. Then again, Daddy never did let Mama have friends and he thinks Mama's family is a herd of godless heathens. He keeps us away from them and Mama lets it happen. Mama lets Daddy do whatever the hell he wants. Why wouldn't she? He'd bust her wide open if she didn't. Plus, my guess is she's trying to make up for cheating on him all those years ago when they were engaged. As far as I can tell, it's not working. Daddy still hates Mama most days. When I heard about how Iggy was made in a smelly barn and not a sacred marriage bed, it made me want to throw up. 
It's been almost a year and I still, still feel like barfing at the thought of Mama and this man humping away in the hay, their bare, pasty skin all covered in goose pimples and sweat. I can't stop thinking about it though, even when the sick taste is in my mouth and my throat is as tight as a fistful of quarters. I think about it before I go to bed as the floorboards are creaking and Daddy is grunting and Mama is making no noise at all. I think about it in science class when Mr. Farley talks in his deep, garbled voice about stamens and pistols. And shouldn't we all know not to giggle at these lessons by now? Shouldn't we think of flower reproduction as a gift from the good Lord and not fodder for the dirty hell spawn thoughts? I think of it when Iggy wonders why Daddy hates him, but I never tell Iggy what I know. Sometimes when I imagine Will Willie McIntyre, he looks like Bugs Bunny, buck teeth and all. Sometimes he looks like a movie star. Sometimes he looks like the devil. I've never seen him and I never will because Mama said even before she knew she was pregnant, Daddy took his rifle to Willie's house and told him to leave town or he'd kill him. Willie left. When Daddy says he'll kill you, you believe him. His eyes get flat and shiny like asphalt on a hot day. They go dead. Sometimes knowing is torture. You wish you could hide your secret away in a dark cobwebby shed, shut the door and break the key in the lock so no one can ever get in again. You wish that you could go to sleep and have your last thought be anything but the buttery light of the New Mexico moon sneaking in through the cracks of an old barn's walls. But you can't erase the knowing and you can never tell your secret. If there is one thing this world has taught me, it's that no matter how bad things get, they can always get worse. Secrets should stay secrets. It keeps them tolerable. Telling secrets turns them into full-on hell. I think this as I stare at Iggy. We're lying under the porch. It's so hot, sweat is trickling from the sandy tips of Iggy's hair and zigzagging over his freckles, mixing with the tears that keep sneaking out of his rust-colored eyes. He's trying not to cry, I can tell. He never cries anymore, not even in front of me. But today, Daddy said he was gonna kill him, and today we believe him. He'll never find us here, I whisper. When I touch Iggy's arm, I notice how small and white my hands look. My fingers tremble at my bold-faced lie. Still, I say it again, he'll never find us here, Iggy. I lie partly for Iggy, partly for me. Maybe Daddy won't find us, you never know. But deep down, I know the truth. Daddy always finds us. Iggy only cries harder. He squeezes his eyes shut to make the tears stay in his head. We can hear Daddy in the house calling for us in his thunder voice. Mara, Iggy. The way he says our names makes them sound like cuss words. If we were close enough, we would smell the whiskey on his breath and see the bulging vein in his forehead. But we aren't that close. We're under the porch praying Daddy won't find us and take the belt to Iggy. Bars of sunlight fall like slices of heaven between the slats of the porch abo above us. Dust swirls in the light. To me, it looks like a golden cloud. When I try to catch it like I would a firefly, it slips through my fingers. I try again. You gotta try to hold on to beauty when you find it. I'm gonna do it, sis, Iggy says. I'm just gonna go out there and knock the shit out of him. No, Iggy, no. I whisper, because last time Iggy tried that, Daddy nearly killed him. He was out of school for two weeks. Granted, Iggy was six inches shorter then and had a lot less muscle, but still. The thought of losing my brother scares me more than anything in the world. He's my only safe place. I'd die without him. Don't go, Iggy, I say, and he thinks for a minute. I grab Iggy's hand and we catch some dust between our fingers. After a moment, he says, the sweet smell of the corn that's ready to be harvested and the musty smell of the mist rising from the river on the other side of the fields wafts in on the breeze. We just lie there staring at the sunlight falling over our hands, noticing the way they fit together so perfectly. I watch my skin glow, thinking maybe I'm an angel sent from God to protect Iggy because God knew what a screwed up family he lived in. I always thought that Iggy was my angel, but today, I wonder if it's the other way around. 
When I was little in Sunday school, they told us that the angels have big, strong hands and fiery swords that they used to vanquish all their foes. They told us that no man on earth or demon from hell can stand up before the power of those flaming swords. But I feel like an angel with a small hand and no sword. I didn't lose the fucking hammer, sis, Iggy says. Of course he didn't. I know that. Who doesn't know that? What would he want with Daddy's old hammer anyway, for God's sake? I squeeze his hand. He shakes his head. Then why the hell is he after me again? I hate that crazy son of a bitch. I think like mad. How can I explain Daddy's anger without lying? I'm two full years younger than Iggy, and he's usually the one explaining things to me. To me. Iggy has see clear through you eyes eyes that see everything. He taught me about just all I know. He taught me science and math and verb conjugations. He taught me how to gut a fish. Iggy's the smart one, but today I'm the explainer because I know what I know. I know he's a bastard and that's why daddy hates him. I know daddy proposed to mama because in those days she was movie star pretty with soft blonde white curls and legs as long as the railroad tracks between Barnaby and Santa Fe. And I know he married her even after he found out about Lily because no way in hell was he going to let her shame him with her boredom. Mama said so on the phone and that now I know Daddy hates Ziggy because he's a walking sin. And that's that. But I can't tell my secret so I say, Iggy, you're not the reason Daddy gets mad. He was born mad. I hate him for not seeing how good you are. Someday, I'm gonna leave this town. Leave all those dresses he buys me so he'll miss me when I'm gone. I swear, I'm gonna make him cry the way he makes you cry. We huddle there on the musty earth, sweating, our palms pressed together listening to the whisper whisper of our breathing and the stomp of daddy's boots as he searches heaven and hell and everywhere in between for the satellites of his wife's bastard son. Someday, whispers Iggy, I'm gonna leave too and I'm gonna do something great. I'll become a pilot or a president and then he'll know what I am. He'll look at me and say he's sorry and I'll tell him to go straight to hell. I don't say anything to that. Mama once told me, sure enough, your brother is a gentle giant. She took a long drag off her cigarette, but someday, you mark my words, your brother is gonna snap. Someday when your daddy gives him what for, he's gonna give it back to him. You just watch out for that day. She seemed hopeful when she said it, smiled a little secret smile. Remembering her words now, I feel anything but hopeful. I, pr I pray today isn't that day. Above us, the screen door slams. You hear that, sis? Iggy asks me. When he talks, his breath is low and raspy like he swallowed a swarm of bees. Daddy's thunder gets closer. He's outside now and his footsteps pound on the ground. Iggy, is that you? He bellows, and we can see the waffle prints of his boot soles overhead. Iggy holds my hand tighter. Get out here now, boy, or I'll whip you double good, shouts Daddy. Iggy looks at me and I kiss his cheek. My eyes beg him to keep his mouth shut. I'm under here, he says. He starts to roll away from me. No, Iggy, no. Daddy looks under the porch. I'm not sure whether he's a man or a demon as he stares at Iggy. That blue vein is bulging. You have been hiding from me, boy? When he grabs Ziggy by the arm and yanks him from his hiding place, I wish that I had a fiery angel sword. I have only my small hands, so I crawl out and stand there trembling while Daddy stares Iggy down, breathing hot and heavy and slow. Daddy's holding a warped two by four. You hiding from me, boy? He asks again. Iggy balls up his fists. He stares right back at Daddy into his dead eyes. I can't believe how brave he is. The bees are still bugging and buzzing in Iggy's throat long and low. I didn't take your hammer, Daddy, he says. Daddy lifts the two by four. Come again? Iggy has never been in a fight before, not really. He tried to stand up to Daddy that one time, but other than that, Mama's right. He's a gentle giant. He fishes, chops the heads off the chickens so I won't have to. 
but mostly he hates to hurt anything. Right now, though, his face has that hard look, the one that's the one he had that day he fought back. He raises his fist, and I almost feel hopeful, almost think it's going to knock Daddy straight into forever. The two-by-four slams into the side of Iggy's head. He groans, stumbles backward, falls to the ground in a crumpled heap like a pile of old dirty laundry. Daddy drops the two-by-four. You want to repeat yourself, boy? Daddy's fist whipple, whistle and whip through the air, finding Iggy's face and his back and his freckled arms when he holds them up to stop the blows. Everything is happening so fast, I can't see what part of Iggy Daddy is going to hit next, and I can't tell, I can't remember which part of him he hit last. I can't tell where the blood is coming from, and I can't tell who's screaming no, me or Iggy. And then Daddy's footsteps fade into the house and he's gone. Iggy's curled up in the grass. I wonder if he's dead. My scream gets caught in my throat. Finally, it breaks through my lips, coming out in a hoarse whisper. Iggy! I stare at my brother's bloody face, his twisted hands, the stillness of his eyelids. Iggy! His body lurches and he starts to shake and sob. He's not dead. The blood that's pumping down his cheeks is hot, fresh, alive. I'm thankful for that, so thankful my chest almost explodes. I raise to his side and hold him and say, I hate you, Daddy, I hate you, Daddy. Daddy's back in the house so he can't hear me, but Iggy tells me not to hate because it will eat me up like the Hansel and Gretel witch, and I wonder where in God's name he comes up with this stuff anyway. Why does Iggy suddenly care if I hate Daddy when 10 minutes ago, Iggy was saying he hated him too? How can he not hate Daddy after what Daddy just did? We huddle together until the sun falls behind the low rolling hills, casting orange light over the cornfields and the golden grass. Daddy's boots stop stomping and we know he's hiding in his room now, the way he does when his hitting is done. We know he will pass out soon. We know he won't come out again until morning. The summer's heat still rages. I worry that we will get ticks behind our ears from lying in the grass for too long, especially with the smell of Iggy's blood to attract them. Some of the blood is coming from Iggy's eye, which is purple and swollen halfway shut. I know ice is a thing for bruises and swelling, so I take Iggy's hand and help him up. We tiptoe into the house and into Mama's kitchen. She's sitting there at the table, her delicate, clean hands folded neatly in her lap. She stares at the pink roses embroidery on her white lace tablecloth. She doesn't look up when we walk in. We need ice, Mama, I say. And she nods, standing slowly as if she's a beauty queen being called to the microphone to talk about starving children and how she'd love to fill their bellies with nice warm milk. Mama smooths the wrinkles on her apron. I wonder how her candy apple colored lipstick stays so perfect. Not a bit of it gummed on her straight white teeth in this humidity. You okay, sport? She asks Iggy. She reaches up to tousle his wheat colored hair and dabs at the clotted blood with the corner of her starched apron. Iggy nods and she smiles and says, that's my boy. She opens the freezer and a breath of winter comes whooshing out, cooling us down a little bit. Fanning her face with her manicured fingertips, Mama slowly presses her breath out through her big lips, the way she does when she's smoking cigarettes. It was a hot one out there today. She laughs and takes the ice trays from the freezer if she in, as if she intends to pop the cubes into a glass of fresh squeezed lemonade. I swear, Mara. I never was meant to be a farmer's wife, that much I know. She sighs, folding a checkered dishcloth around the ice cubes. I should have gone to Albuquerque with my cousin. When Wanda went off to that cosmetology school, I should have gone there too. She makes $40 an hour now, did I tell you that? I shake my head now. Well, she goes on, she does. And I'm not sure this life is suited to me. I think she's right. She has a magazine girl hairstyle and white oval fingernails. 
She should be one of those women in the television ads that click clack around their city houses in fancy shoes and designer jeans, dusting things and declaring that they could never live a moment without their Swiffer mom. She presses the dishcloth to Eddie's eye. He raises a hand to hold it, and when she sees the way his pinky finger sticks out straight to the side, her face crumples like she's going to cry. Instead, she pulls it together and says, I do declare, Iggy, the scrapes you boys get yourselves into sometimes. If I had my angel sword, I'd hit her over the head with it for being so dumb and blind. She knows right well how Iggy got hurt. Maybe a good whack with a fiery sword would get her thinking and talking straight. I cross my arms and stare hard at her, knowing she's trying, knowing she's trying to make up for what Daddy did. She wipes at Iggy's eye until the blood is gone, and she kisses him on the cheek and says, You're the boy I always wanted, Iggy. If I could have any boy in the whole world for my pick, it'd be you. His eyes flare like the August sun, like he has been waiting all his life to hear someone say this, even though Mama says it every time Daddy beats him. Mama takes Iggy by the hand and leads him up the stairs and tucks him into his bed. He lets her, mostly for her sake. That's how Iggy is, always taking care of me and Mama, always trying to make Mama believe she's a good Mama, even though she fucking sucks. If she needs him to, if she needs him to treat him like he's four to make up for what daddy did, Iggy will let her, but it's not bringing him comfort. I know mama expects me to go to bed too, though she's busy making, so busy making up for Iggy's bloody eye and busted finger that she doesn't have time to say so. She knows I'll do what's right without being asked, because that's what angels do best. I huddle in my bed, listening to mama trying to sing Iggy to sleep, even though he's a full 17 years old. When her shoes click clack down the stairs, I tiptoe across the hall and crawl into Iggy's bed. Hey sis, he whispers, and his hand finds mine in the dark. We lie there together side by side, watching the window as the moon rises into the sky like a lost lemon meringue pie. We don't talk. Iggy will cry if he tries, and if I talk, I'll tell my secret for sure, and how will that fix anything so I don't say a word. We fall asleep with our hands still stuck together and me thinking that everything will be all right in the morning. Mama will cook us breakfast and sing about clowns with their pants falling down and how the world is a stage of entertainment. The pancakes will be warm and just the right kind of brown. Daddy won't be drunk anymore and he'll call me his rosebud and send me off to school with a kiss on the cheek. And there I'll learn that flies carry so many germs it's a miracle that any of us filthy hooligans are still alive and scientists think that cell phones might cause cancer, and the larks on the wings, and the snails on the thorn, and God's in his heaven, and all's right with the world. So, that's, thank you. <laughs> that's the first part of chapter one. Um, and as I said, um, I, know, I know it's a dark, it goes to dark places, but I, I do pray. I, in my deepest, truest moments, that somewhere between the lines of darkness, um, there, are, there are shades of light. So I hope that people when they read this book find that. I wanted to, I usually do this, and I know there's, my last two readings have had like 50 people, so this is like different for me. Um, but if anyone has any questions, I'm willing to answer them. Does anybody have anything? I work to Dad. Thanks, They've been waiting all day to meet you, Martine. Uh, <laughs> I've been hearing all about you. <laughs> I told him you're one of the only people in the world who makes me feel stupid because you're so smart. <laughs> so does, yes, Leslie? Um, I read a book last year that's by a local author named Dana Reinhart called Odessa Again. And in the book, there's a, a sister and brother, and toward the end, it, it says um, um, he was hers and she was his, and something they always would be. And I just wanted to point out that um, that I mean, it's um, you know, it's a climactic moment when um, the girls find each other. But I think one of the most powerful parts of the book is the 
um, the intense devotion of the brother and sister. I think mm -hmm. it's just um, it's uh, remarkable and um, and so amazing in a, a situation where so many people are destructive to each other that these two amidst this can still just have this incredible love for each other and devotion. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad that came through. Um, I actually did base, and I was not raised in this kind of an abusive family. I, in fact, that's why I dedicated it to my parents who taught me the way of love so people wouldn't be like their parents and monsters because <laughs> I wasn't raised in this family. But I did re base um, the relationship between a brother and sister on my relationship with my brother. We grew up in a place, Barnaby was close by, mm -hmm. but we were on the mountain. Mm -hmm. Barnaby was like the big city for us. <laughs> it was it was not called Barnaby, but um, Barnaby is very much based on the town that was near our town. And, and we were kind of like the only friend each other had. Mm -hmm. So there was a really cool connection. And my brother is actually um, a preacher now. My dad was a preacher, my mom was a preacher. And my dad, and so we oh, can imagine how I go over. But um, I was really terrified when this book came out. In fact, I sabotaged my writing career for years, honestly, because I was terrified of what my family was going to do if they saw my writing. And they never, when did they first read it? No, <laughs> the, I, they, read they it kept yet? asking, and I was like, um, no, you know what? Well, I was putting it out, and they read it, and I got the most beautiful letter from my brother um, the day after he read it, and he told me the book had changed his life and changed his perspective on a lot of things, and he said he felt, um, he thanked me for writing it. And he said that was a book that had to be written, which I would have sort of expected from my brother because he's pretty expansive ultimately. Um, but my mother, I did not expect that from. And I just got a letter from her a few days ago. She was on her way to Israel to do a missionary trip. <laughs> and she read it on the way there. And she, um, she also thanked me for writing. And she said, it was really hard to read as your mom. And she was probably the only person that ever read it that knew instinctively mm -hmm. that the mom was a projection of what I might have you remind her that we haven't sold the rights to Hebrew yet? <laughs> I'll tell her. <laughs> but she was, or Arabic, depending on who she's trying to convert. She's all about the Hebrew. <laughs> but um, she's, she also thanked me for writing, and she said, I think it was a really important book about oppression, and I was really grateful to read it. So my family ultimately really, I underestimated them, and they stunned me with their response. So I, that's all an answer to mm. your, your thought that you shared. So, yeah, just the b relationship between the brother and the sister really is the heartbeat, I think. I think it's also interesting in Marin County because I would imagine a lot of teens who might read it would be so, I mean, we know that people in the South are like this, you know, because that's the way they vote. And so mm -hmm. But um, it's just so different than what we experience around here. I think it's sort of an interesting, you know, uh, a lens into what it's like in the rest of the country. It is. You know, I, I based Reverend Winchell on a preacher I actually heard, and he screamed that he expected fags from the pulpit. It was horrifying to me. Um, and I put that in the book, and my editor actually said, you can't put that in there, no one would say it. And I didn't argue with her, but I don't think somebody does. <laughs> so, you know, like, there are places in the country where this kind of thinking is still Absolutely. very much accepted. So, yeah. Any other questions or thoughts? We're very proud of you. Thank you, Jennifer. We're very proud of you. Thank you. I'm still adjusting, like I said. I traded in my group groupie boots for some really classy writer boots. I'll show you guys when we go to dinner after the picture of the groupie boot. <laughs> it, it makes this look classy. <laughs> Thank you. You know, you said something that's really interesting because I, um, you said that the heart of the book is her relationship with Iggy. I always thought when I read it, and it's probably true for me, that the heart was between, the heart of the book was the relationship between Mara and Zelia. Yeah. And it was like, I mean, you know that when we worked together, I was like completely focused on that. Yeah, and maybe maybe this book has two hearts. It's, it's well, maybe. that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> I think you're right. I think that's also a heartbeat of the book. I mean, yeah, I, the, that's one of the core relationships in the book, certainly. And ma the process that Mara goes through discovering who she is because of love, which is, I, I believe, the purpose of love. Like, that's, that the purpose of love is to make us break out of what we think we know and find out what we really do know. And I feel like that's 
that's the purpose that Celia serves in this book. And with both of these loves are very important because I think if Celia had not come along, um, Mara and Nikki made us, might have stayed in the same place forever. But because of Zillia, Zillia becomes the catalyst for change. So I agree with you, Nadia, and I agree with you, Leslie. <laughs> <laughs> Other thoughts or questions? Anybody want to get a drink or a food? We're <laughs> <laughs> going next door, right? Yeah. Um, so if anybody hasn't bought the book yet and you want to go buy the book, we can um, have Tony. Um, do autographs, and then we can all go over to Brick and Bottle if you guys want to have some dinner afterward. Um, I'll give you, if, if maybe you already have copies, but if you want to get a copy, you can get that now. And we'll also have copies tomorrow night for those of you who are going to be over there tomorrow night. And again, thank you guys. It's a great fun. stocking stuff. Remember that. <laughs> <laughs> for all your friends. <laughs> thank you guys. You know, with your two foot swizzle sticks. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think everyone knows that he's my agent, right? <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't have a vested interest in this book at all.